Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And sorry about the delay there. Here's the irony. The problem with having an archivist on as a guest is the archivist comes with loads and loads of archives and the fire was a little bit big. We couldn't get it to work. But anyway, we're there now. So if you've been with us this week for the four shows we had on Romania at war, uh, very harrowing, uh, tough subject to deal with, Holocaust, deportations. Today's show is a different one. We're moving to the Southern Hemisphere and 80 years ago today, was the incredible rescue of Douglas MacArthur from the Philippines that set into motion the whole I Shall Return business. So my guest today, James Zobel, is an author, a historian, historian and archivist at the MacArthur Memorial, and he is waiting to join me now. So uh, good afternoon, James. Hey, Paul. How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm glad, glad we're up and running. That was, that was a little bit of a, one of those things with live broadcasting. But so MacArthur, 80 years ago, but before we get into the story of what happened, how does one become a MacArthur archivist? What, 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 how did your route begin to where you are now handling, if I understand it, a million documents and 100,000 photos? Uh, I couldn't make any money surfing. Um, so it basically <laughs> came down to school. Uh, I did all my graduate work here. And pretty much the day I graduated, the former archivist left and so i just kind of sat down in the chair and that was 30 years ago i've been here ever since wow and as we when we talked and i had our pre-chat a couple of weeks ago when i had kevin hemalon who writes about general pattern i'm sure every time you meet someone and you introduce yourself as working for macarthur people tell you their opinion of douglas <laughs> Mark, macarthur whether you ask for it or not so how do you manage the fact that he is a person that every single person has an opinion on well, you're, that's very true in what you're saying. And uh, many times I've had to say, stop yelling at me. My name is not Douglas MacArthur. Um, but it it varies both sides. Um, it's like uh, a lot of people say there's no middle ground. You either like him very much or, or you don't like him at all. Uh, I tend to run into that D. Clayton James thing, like him on Wednesday, don't like him on Thursday. Um, so it, it, it varies every day. Uh, you can sit there and admire him and five minutes later you're like what are you doing and why are you doing this um so it's yeah it's a mixed bag but it's always interesting you know the guy's got a 52 year career um serves from uh basically the first world war through korea you know and um uh, pretty much rides the crest of the wave um for the 20th century you know and is a mover and a shaker most most definitely and absolutely, is someone who who wanted to keep stuff. I mean, there are big figures from World War II where there's not that much information around. around about. They didn't keep diaries. They weren't very um, good at public relations. Well, one thing we can't can't accuse MacArthur of is not being good at PR, <laughs> not being good at keeping a record of himself. Because you know he, he is part of the instigator of how this archive is created. It, you know, he he was as you said this amazingly long career, and he realized there's this body of work. So just tell her, the folks before we get into the presentation, just how much stuff are you dealing with there at the, memor at the memorial? Well, the amazing thing is that everything he owns prior to World War II all gets destroyed in the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, so uh, everything from World War I, his father's memoirs, uh, you know, his father was a very famous Civil War uh, general, I mean, uh, soldier, as well as a, a military governor in the Philippines. And uh, so everything that comes here is everything collected after 1942. Uh, and there's probably about, you know, we have 18 of his general's papers. There's probably about 2 million pages of documents here, over 100,000 photographs, about 600 films. So it's a it's a very monstrous collection. There's about 40,000 wow. books. Um, so it's it's and it's growing exponentially all the time. Wow. I mean, and this is the thing. We are in the digital age where more and more archives are available online. People can access them from around the world now. This is the. The revolution really in understanding history is that people like me on youtube and all the other youtubers out there can bring people together and they can share these resources and where you had to travel to an archive to see the collection now the yeah. archive can be released to some extent online Everywhere. and it's an amazing oh, yeah. amazing era to be part of so well, well let's get to the the events that were happening 80 years ago today and you've got a lot of images uh, to supply with them and folks you're bound to have questions for James about MacArthur. And yes, of course, we can do some of those. But really, we are here to talk about the operation to get him out of it's, the, the Philippines. It, it's, it's not so much a biopic about the general. It's about the operation to get him out. And yeah. with this insider information that James has from the archives. So I'll pull up the PowerPoint, which you, you're going to control. So um, 
um there we go so um folks if you have questions please fire away we'll do some as we go along and we'll do some at the end of there and um over to you essentially james Okay, well, uh, thanks everybody, and thanks for having me. Good evening. Uh, uh, like Paul said, I work here at the MacArthur Memorial, uh, and basically, the the story that we're talking about tonight, eighty years ago, it, it starts in about nineteen thirty five, and uh, MacArthur had been a soldier for about thirty two years. Then his father, like we talked about, was a Civil War hero. Uh, was the American Civil War was in the uh, Spanish American War. Was military governor in the Philippines. Douglas MacArthur grows up on these Western outposts. He'll go to West Point. He'll be the number one graduate in his class. He'll be uh, first captain corps cadets. He'll have a stellar World War I record. Uh, it's attested to. Uh, he's the most uh, decorated general uh, during that war for the United States. His bravery is seen by everybody. Uh, general Pershing will say that he's my best battlefield commander. And he'll also say that uh, he has a very high belief in his own abilities. MacArthur will serve three terms in the Philippines, and then as well in 1930, he'll become the chief of staff of the United States Army, where he'll serve for five years. And that's really where our story picks up is about 1935. In 34, the Tidings McDuffie Act had been signed by Roosevelt. This was going to give the Philippines uh, their independence in 1946. Of course, the Philippines had been controlled by the United States since the Spanish-American War. Uh, and the first president is going to be Manuel Quezon. Quezon is a, a lawyer, a legal mind. He had been a big instigator behind the independence movement for the Philippines. And one of his best friends is Douglas MacArthur. They meet each other in 1903. They'll know each other through the years. They consider themselves as brothers. Uh, MacArthur will be the godfather of Quezon's son and vice versa. Quezon will be MacArthur's Godfather, they are compadres, and that is a very close system in the Philippines at that time. Uh, when Quezon takes over, he approaches MacArthur and says, do you think the Philippines can be defended? And MacArthur says, as long as I've got the money and as long as I've got the support of the United States, yes, they can be defended. Mm -hmm. And so Quezon brings him as Philippine military advisor. MacArthur will go out there with a young officer as his chief of staff, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, Jimmy Ord will also be along. And they come out there to build a new army for the Philippines, a new defense force for the Philippines, because the Quezon's really worried about a lot of the moves that the Japanese are making. And he knows that once his country is on its feet, it'll be fledgling and pretty much open to anybody that can get them. Uh, after a few years, Eisenhower will see uh, MacArthur as the emperor with no clothes. And um, though later in life, he'll speak glowingly of their time and talk about everything that MacArthur you know, taught him. Uh, at this time, he detests MacArthur, and especially as you can see in his diary entries for the early part of the war. They go to Manila. It's the Pearl of the Orient. It's been owned by the United States since, since 1898. They built a the Americans have laid out a, a very beautiful city amongst all the Spanish ruins. It's very cheap to live there. MacArthur wants nowhere else to be. As coming out there, he'll be there to f build this defense project. He has an idea of building it like Switzerland, uh, using a cadre of trained uh, Filipinos and then having the call-ups every year until you have pretty much like universal military training. Everybody is going to be in the service. Uh, and as well, he'll think of using this fleet of attack boats, small attack boats, to be able to defend the coastline. One of the stipulations he makes, though, coming out there is he wants to be a field marshal, uh, the only one that the United States uh, ever has, or, you know, the MacArthur is a field marshal of the Philippines, but the only officer to hold that title. And Eisenhower thinks it's one of the dumbest things he's ever heard of. When MacArthur comes back in 37 with Kazan to the United States, uh, he'll be lambasted in the press. You know, you're a field marshal of a non-existent army. MacArthur never understands why all the criticism, uh, but he'll get it. And he won't go back home for 14 years after that. Wow. The one thing that he's doing in trying to build this army is he brings, you know, the first uh, group in and it's basically teaching them basic hygiene. Most of these people are living in villages. They don't know anything about living in the field. It's, uh, you know, there's not going to be any kind of real military training going on, maybe close order drill. Now it's just teaching them how to live in the field and how to, you know, dig latrines and, and basically things like that. MacArthur will look to this man. This is Sid Huff. He had been a naval officer. He was there in the Philippines when MacArthur gets there. And MacArthur's really into this idea of, of building this fleet of attack boats, what will, you know, the United States will call the PT boats. 
and he'll be looking to get them from Britain. He'll get two Thornycraft, Thornycroft uh, models out there. The, the Philippines will build one, but by the time the war starts, there's basically only three of them. Um, that's the old S-41 submarine boat that's in the back of that one right there as it's going through Manila Bay in 39. So as you get to, um, in MacArthur's dealings with this uh, Philippine uh, military they're not throwing in, in any money. The things that the United States had promised them, that's not coming. And about 1937, the United States doesn't want to spend any more money on it. Uh, you've got a lot of people in the press saying MacArthur is out there militarizing the Philippines. He's doing nothing but provoking the Japanese. But as well, you have a lot of people in the War Department who don't believe the Philippines can be defended at all. Uh, Walter Kruger, who will be MacArthur's sixth army commander in World War II, doesn't believe they can. And so they will call MacArthur and tell him, we're going to end this mission and we want you to come back to the United States as a two star. MacArthur's not going to do that. Uh, he decides to stay. Kazan will pick up the tab. He'll pay for the military mission from then on. And um, MacArthur really is this man alone. He doesn't have any U.S. Army backing anymore. He's got no position. And uh, the people there uh, really will not pay attention to him. And well, William A. White was a was a writer. His son wrote They Were Expendable, the, the book about right, uh, yeah. the PT boat release. He comes to the Philippines to see MacArthur because MacArthur is the only one who's really talking about what the Japanese are doing, what's going on. William White is a bigger believer in this. But the first thing he does is he goes to see uh, George Gruner, who is the uh, Philippine department commander and and he says, I want to see MacArthur. And Gruner's like, why are you going to talk to him? You know, there's no reason to go see him. And <clears throat> White goes and tells MacArthur that. And so that's what I mean by a man alone. He's not really, you know, in the mix anymore. And they they don't want to mix with him. Now, MacArthur had always called Manila home. Uh, he had brought his mother there when he came in 35. She immediately died there. He brought everything he owned to the Philippines. That's why it all gets destroyed in 1942. Uh, he meets his second wife, Jean, out there. They have their son, Arthur, and it is home to them. But MacArthur's thinking something different. Uh, as the Japanese are you know, in 37 and they go into China proper, He's wanting to get back in the game. He doesn't want to be outside uh, when this thing is going to happen. And so he starts lobbying Roosevelt as well as the War Department for something to do, saying, I'm, you know, if you don't have any position for me out here, I'm going to uh, come home. Is that some kind of leverage we, he's using? We're not sure. This is Grunert and MacArthur here. Grunert's head of the Philippine Department, very well known. He is lobbying to get the Philippine Army put under him. He wants a lot more munitions, more planes. He says, you know, let's build it up out here so we can keep this thing going. MacArthur knows what he's doing, and MacArthur is, that's the same time he's lobbying the president. Now, back home, they're thinking the same thing. In July of 1941, after the Japanese militarized uh French Indochina, Roosevelt slaps the iron embargo, uh, puts the freeze on the assets, oil embargo. And he starts thinking, I'm going to call MacArthur back to the colors. George C. Marshall is all about this. When MacArthur is e or messaging Marshall and saying, I'm going to come home, Marshall's like, you sit tight out there. We probably got something going on. So July 26th, they recall MacArthur to the colors. He's 61 years old. He'll be a lieutenant general. They'll make him like a you know a major general, lieutenant general the next day, and a full general when the war starts. Uh, but MacArthur now is in charge of all the uh, army forces there in the Philippines. And they will call up the Philippine Army. He's got the Philippine Division, which is the best troops there, but the U.S. Army's 31st. 31st Infantry Division. It's the only all-American unit there. Uh, then he's got the uh, 57th, 45th Scouts, uh, Philippine Scouts. These are some of the best of the best. He's got the 26th Cavalry there as well. He's got the Harbor Defense Command with Corregidor. Um, and uh, this is with the 59th, 60th Coast Artillery, 91st, 92nd Philippine Scout Artillery. They'll also have the a concrete battleship at Fort Drum. It's got two batteries of 14 inches. And then you've got uh, Fort Hughes and Fort Frank on Caballo and, and Carabao Islands. Now, these are to protect Mila, Manila Bay, uh, to hold Manila Bay for as long as they can until the U.S. Navy gets there. But the problem is, is that these uh, places are all built before air power and they are not going to be able to withstand it. As well, MacArthur calls up over 100,000 effectives. They feel like they can train the 1st Battalion and then get them to help train the, the other two battalions of, of, of each regiment. And uh, they will call them up throughout. There are 10 military districts in the Philippines. This is William F. Sharp. 
they'll con, uh, control the Visayan Mindanao Command. Those are all the islands to the south. Half of these guys won't ever see uh, any action because they're on these islands that are, are pretty much left out of the combat until right at the end. Now, the plan is once that they had put the iron oil embargo on the Japanese. They know the Japanese are immediately going to look at the Dutch East Indies. That's where all the oil is. That puts the Philippines right in the crosshairs. So Hap Arnold, uh, the air chief and uh, Marshall get together and they decide that they're going to pump about 250 bombers in B-17s, B-24s, and have that be an interdiction zone uh, in the Philippines. The problem is that at that time, there's only two fields that can hold the bombers. That's Clark Field and Del Monte down on Mindanao Island. Um, and so while they're pumping in uh, some material, they've got two tank battalions, the light steward tanks. They got a coast artillery unit uh, that's going to be an anti aircraft unit uh, from Mexico coming in. They've got a lot of aviation engineers to start building airfields everywhere, but they'll also start pumping in the P 40. They're going to build up about four or five pursuit groups, the 3rd, 17th, 20th, 21st, 34th. Um, these guys are using a lot of the old P 26s, P 35s. They got some of the uh, P-40B Tomahawk's there, but they'll start getting in the P-40E Kitty Hawk. The thing is, is the problem is they don't send any coolant with them when they send them out there. So that whole first month, they're all grounded. And so they're not going to get any training in these planes until uh, the last couple of weeks right before the war. The big thing, the wonder weapon they're going to put in is the B-17. This one's in the silver schematic that it is um, when they first get there. Uh, they'll get about 35 of them in there uh, before the war starts. Um, the a uh, couple in the one bomb group that they have out there. They have plans to bring in 27th bomb group and a seventh bomb group as well. But as like we were saying, they don't have the grounds to, to hold all these people right now as well. Uh, they want to get a new air force commander out there. Henry Claggett, that's him next to Gruner right there. Uh, Claggett is uh, sickly. He had been all throughout China and he's in the hospital most of the time. And they also don't believe that he can handle a full uh, Air Force headquarters. So they offer MacArthur, that is uh, George C. Marshall offers MacArthur, Lewis Brereton. MacArthur says, yep, send him out here. The thing is, is Brereton goes to see Marshall right before he comes out there and and he says, you're sending all these planes out there with any out any kind of any aircraft defense whatsoever. Nothing that's going to there. And Marshall's basically like, that'll come. Don't don't question me, you know, about my business. <clears throat> so Brereton already sees the problem that's out there. MacArthur will have to deal with Admiral Tommy Hart. He's the head of the Asiatic fleet since 1939. He established headquarters in Manila, October of 1940. Hart, he knows very well. Hart had graduated with his brother, Arthur MacArthur from the Naval Academy. Uh, Hart had been a pallbearer at, at his brother's funeral, but Hart is older and will always look at MacArthur as the younger brother. They do not get along at all. Hart's got one uh, cruiser, the Houston. He's got a light cruiser, the Boise, about 29 submarines, about 19 destroyers. Um, but he is under uh, U.S. Navy orders. And when MacArthur gets out there and starts getting all these planes coming in, the buildup, even though Hart doesn't like, he gets ginned up and he's asking the Navy to stay there and fight it out. But the Navy's like, nope, you'll be you'll be getting out. And they have the fleet positioned out of Manila Bay down towards the southern islands when the war starts. Um, Hart will will always be contentious with MacArthur and, and he'll say that uh, MacArthur's crazy um, and has been for some time and that MacArthur just knows a lot of things that aren't so. And they just mm. they they will never and, and mix. Just I'm just going to jump in with a question, James, to give you a, sure. a chance to get your breath back as well, because it's fantastic. But at this point, you know, we, we've understood that MacArthur's had, you know, you the no, no, amount of names you've dropped in the last few minutes, you know, Eisenhower, Marshall, Brereton, Hart, you know, do these people he's encountering in various capacities, have they really realized just how invested MacArthur is in the Philippines? Because it's both his strength and his weakness, isn't it? I mean, he, abs as you said yourself, he absolutely loves the place. I mean, he's committed to it. We know that, that now. You've explained that to us. But these people he's, re he's encountering, have they really grasped just how much it means to Douglas at this point? Well, I think they know because they all know how, you know, invested he is with Kazon. Because, um, you know, they'll talk bad about MacArthur to him and he'll be like, I don't want to hear it. You know, that that's my best friend you're talking about. I think he's a genius. Um, and th as well, the thing is, is that, you know, MacArthur, after being called to use safety, that's his job hmm. is to defend the Philippines. You know, the heart, he knows he can leave. 
You know, they're not going to keep the fleet there. Um, he's not in, he's not invested in it at all. But um, that's MacArthur's job. And so uh, as I'll get to in a second, you know, they'll they'll come to realize what's going on. Um, but and and like I always say, MacArthur's a different person now than he was before. His mom is gone. He's got no peers in the army. Pershing's gone. Summerall's gone. And he believes he is the military mind. And no one can really tell him anything. As well, being 61, MacArthur was always famous for being in the field, visiting the troops, knowing the situation, knowing everything was go going on. Now he's using staff officers for that. He's aloof. Nobody really knows who he is. Mm. It's, it's, I'm thinking of the, you know, the, the, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I mean, he, he, as you said, at 61, after a certain age, people just stop learning new ways of doing things. I mean, we, we got to remember someone like Eisenhower is, is relatively young at the, for, for what yes. he's doing and the job he has later on in, 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 in command of, of Operation Overlord, you know, so he's still someone who is accepting and taking on ideas. Uh, but MacArthur, yeah, you know, I'm thinking of my own my own family. When my dad got to a certain age, that's it. Nothing new went in. It was the I know how to do this, and that was that's that's yeah. that's comes with age. I think. I think, and I believe it wholeheartedly. Uh, he changes come 42, 43. He gets back to being that general of 1918. Right. But uh, right now, no. Okay. You know, he's he's very set, and that he knows exactly what's going on. Now, one okay. of the things that that comes out uh, under Hart is uh, MacArthur had been asking for torpedo boats um, just because he's so enamored with that entire uh, ability that they have. And so when they asked for him, uh, the, the program for the American PT boats had started about 1939. They got one of the Howard uh, Payne Scott. I think that's the 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 British model. And they mm -hmm. sent one of those over and the, the secretary of Navy was so enamored with it. He immediately orders two squadrons, just gives the contract to Elko. There's no bidding or anything. And the first two squadrons they produce are obsolescent. You know, as soon as they come out, they'll have three squadrons by the time of 1941. And they're going to put one of them in the Philippines. This is the U.S. Guadalupe. It travels out to the Philippines with six of the boats that they'll have. The squadron's about 12, they'll send six later, but they'll never get there. This is the six that they're going to have. The commander is John Buckley. Buckley is a, a United States Naval Academy, class of 33. Uh, when he graduated, they didn't have a spot for him, so he became a civilian, and he went down to the Army uh, air training to be a pilot, cracked up a couple of planes, and they wouldn't let him into that. But right when they he got booted out of that, he got his naval commission and they put him on the USS Indianapolis. Uh, he's in Norfolk uh, on a three day hiatus. He takes a, a steamer up to Washington to, to visit up there. He finds that the Japanese ambassador is on board. He scouts him out and stakes him out. And when he, the ambassador goes to the bathroom that night, Buckley goes in there and steals his briefcase and jumps over the side of this ship and goes right to naval intelligence and delivers this briefcase well the next day he gets orders you're going to china son and he thinks he's like busted and he goes out there he's on one of these sand pebble type uh chinese fleet boats but they start using him as a spy against the the japanese uh in 39 he'll come back to the states he thinks he's going to go to naval air training but then he sees this mosquito boat program he loves it he gets involved with it right from the beginning, and he'll be chosen to lead Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 3. He handpicks all the captains and all the officers and the 68 enlisted men that come out there. Finally, Hart will get the 4th Marines from China. They'll haul them out in uh, the last weeks before the war. Uh, there was contingent there in the Philippines as well. They're very much under strength. Uh, they will be used sparingly during the Bataan campaign. MacArthur holds them on Corregidor for the final defense, but they will they will never see it. In November of 41, Brereton finally comes out to the Philippines, and he's got uh, a new document from MacArthur from the Rainbow Five plans. MacArthur is not going to have to follow Warplane Orange, where they go back to Bataan Corregidor, wait on the for the Navy. MacArthur believes that he'd have to have a maneuverable defense, that that is defeatist. And so now he's planning on defending on the beaches. The thing is, when Brereton gets there, he immediately starts going and uh, outlining how the flights will get from the United States, all those bombers to the Philippines. So MacArthur won't see him for the first month. So when the war starts, they don't know each other. 
And wow. Brereton will only get back for about a week before the war to start training. Now, MacArthur, on the eve of the war, he wrote letters to Gruner. He knows all the problems with the training that's going on. They're not having big time maneuvers. He 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 goes and sees them in the field and writes Gruner of, of everything that's wrong. But the main thing is MacArthur's always saying they're not coming till April of 42, April of 42. But in November of 41, uh, Ambassador Caruso goes through. Uh, the Philippines. He's on his way to help Namora with the negotiations in Washington. And MacArthur said, and this comes from Salomon uh, Bayonetta's oral history. He was MacArthur's aide. He said, MacArthur freaked out because he was like, Caruso is not the guy you send to make peace in Washington. And he knows that things are going to start happening quick. And this is what I think his greatest mistake is. He sends Gruner home. Uh, he should have made him his his uh, uh, North Luzon force commander. He knows everyone. He gets along with Hardy. He gets along with Kazon. He had mapped out Baton for you know the strategic withdrawal, uh, and he was ready to go. And he gets rid of him and puts in uh, Wayne Wright again, a person that he knows, but but not really. Uh, the big war warning comes in November. They say that the the diplomatic relations aren't going to work beyond a situational guard of everything. Uh, MacArthur uh, has shoot down orders because they're finding phantom planes over the, the Philippines. The Japanese are doing recon over there. Um, so they've got it together, so to speak. Uh, but then Sayer calls a meeting with MacArthur and, and Hart. And Hart is totally fatalistic. These the islands are going to fall. We're going to have to pull out. Whereas MacArthur is basically chomping at the bit. But even though he knows about Caruso, he still tells these guys April of 42. Uh, and, and they're just flabbergasted that, you know, MacArthur is still saying, is he trying to allay Sayers' fears? We're not real sure. But, you know, mm -hmm. we knew that he knew what the deal was. And it's not going to be April. The Tojo government had aligned themselves with the Nazis and the tripartite pact. Um, they know that once the oil embargo is on, they need all that oil in the Dutch East Indies. And so they make the decision to go for their their play. Pearl Harbor uh, comes along and uh, eight hours is it's eight hours later in the Philippines. It's December 8th already. And at about uh, four o'clock, this is the, the war is broken message. About four o'clock in the morning, uh, Sutherland, MacArthur's chief staff, hears it on the radio, tells MacArthur. MacArthur goes down to Calle Victoria, the headquarters. Um, then the Navy calls him, tells him they've got the word. Uh, the War Department will send MacArthur two messages, and he doesn't answer them. And not until later when uh, Leonard Garreau and Warplanes calls him and says, you know, why didn't you answer those messages? MacArthur's like, well, I, I just didn't. And this message doesn't come in until much later. When Garreau called him, he said, what's going on? Nothing had happened yet. None, you know, they'd had the word that there'd been some attacks at Davao down in Mindanao. Uh, but as yet, no Japanese bombers have made it to the Philippines. Actually, this message doesn't come in until after Clark Field is bombed. And that's the big controversy of this whole thing. What happened? How did 17 of those bombers get destroyed on the field when they had word of everything happening? Uh, the, they had moved half of them down to, uh, Mindanao the week before MacArthur will always say that he and Sutherland ordered all of them down there, but they never got down there. The biggest controversy comes with these two, Brereton and Sutherland. Sutherland is the gatekeeper at Calle Victoria. Brereton comes there at five o'clock. I want to bomb Formosa. And, uh, Sutherland tells him, you know, you can't see MacArthur. You can plan for the bombing, but don't go yet. You need final authorization from MacArthur. <clears throat> Brereton will leave. We'll come back at seven o'clock. Again, I got to see MacArthur. We got to bomb Formosa. Even though they've never done any recon of Formosa because that wasn't allowed during that uh, the pre-war period. Again, Sutherland tells him no. And then and and Brereton was like, I insist. And Sutherland goes in and sees MacArthur and comes out and says, No, we're we're waiting for you know uh, an overt act by the 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 Japanese. And uh, Brereton's like, well, what about Pearl Harbor? Isn't that an overt act? And MacArthur's under this belief that they are under some kind of neutrality. He'll hold on to that till the 1950s. Lewis Morton, who writes the Green Series book, The Fall of the Philippines, does an interview with MacArthur, and MacArthur's I didn't know about neutrality. And it's not until about 10 o'clock that, that he gives Brereton the go-ahead at uh, the problem for the Japanese was that uh, Formosa got fogged over that morning. And when they get the go ahead to go, uh, they come in, they dupe all the radars at EVA. Everybody goes up, all the B-17s, all the P-40s, and they don't go to Clark. They go to Baguio. And so then everybody's up in the air about 10 o'clock. Uh, MacArthur gets confirmation of Baguio and Davao calls 
uh, Brereton and says, go ahead, do what you need to do. But the thing is, is even though Brereton since five o'clock have been in the morning, been told to plan, they've got no plans. They've gotten together nothing. They haven't put any recon. This is the fog. This is being green at war. This is not really uh, having a good idea of how fast things are going to progress because uh, when the bombers come down at 1130, they get that uh, word that they're going to mass up to get ready to go on a photo recon and then maybe a bombing mission. Uh, but then here come the Japanese again. And the problem is, is in communications, the guys who run the P-40s are telling them everything's going to Manila and that's where they send the air cover. And then as well, they don't tell anyone in the 19th bomb group that the planes are coming. So it's mass confusion, a lot of communication problems. But overall, it's MacArthur's fault. Uh, he should have moved him. He should have done something. They waited too long and he wasn't up on it. You know, does he understand war air power at that point? Not too sure. This will be the big lesson for the rest of the war. Um, and he'll have to take all the blame for it. Two days later, because now your air power is down, um, Nichols Field in Manila is destroyed and they bomb Cavite, the, the big naval base where they have all the repair facilities, all the aviation fuel, all the gas, everything that they need to, to run a naval war. Even though the the uh, most of the fleet is down south and is left, you still got the submarines and the PT boats there. The PT boats under Buckley had, had been there. They got everything uh, ready to go. They were there arming torpedoes, loading them up, and had just finished when the bombing starts. They go out in the water. They're getting chased by airplanes. The uh, PT-31 shoots down two of them, and PT-34 shoots down another one. Uh, they'll, they'll about a thousand people killed at Cavite. They'll spend the whole day uh, transporting wounded to Manila docks. Then on December 17th, when the you, the SS Corregidor sinks, when it's taking supplies and people down south, uh, they'll be on duty uh, picking up about 200 survivors of that and getting them to uh, the the hospitals there at Manila. Um, basically, uh, very hard opening days for everybody all the way around. Two weeks later, uh, Japanese General Homa and the 14th Area Armory will land 48th Infantry Division, 16th Infantry Division, 65th Brigades. They'll land at Lingayan, the northern beaches on the 22nd. They'll land at Lamon Bay. Uh, now Manila's in a pincer, and Homa is driving down for Manila. Uh, they wipe out all those Philippine units. Wainwright had about four untrained divisions. Uh, he had the 26th Cavalry and the, the tank units, but they have never worked together in big uh, operations, and it all falls apart. MacArthur had told Kazon he would go back to Warplane Orange on the 12th of December, but he waited until the Japanese came ashore. Now, immediately, he goes back to Warplane Orange, go back to the Bataan Peninsula, Corregidor Island, right there, hold Manila Bay. But now they've wasted all that time and they can't get any supplies into uh, Bataan. And uh, the thing is, is Wainwright there with MacArthur, George Parker, Northern Luzon, Southern Luzon, Force. They'll pull off the withdrawal. They won't lose a lot of, you know, 13,000 Filipinos will defeat, but they're able to make the Japanese stop, deploy, stop, deploy, and they're able to get everyone into uh, Bataan. But now, uh, whereas Warplane Orange figured out about 45,000 effectives, now you got 100,000 people in there, and immediately everybody goes on half rations. This is uh, the, um, the original withdrawal map. They'll get down uh, to a Columpet, and Jones and, and Wainwright will be there when they blow the bridges, and now everybody's into Bataan. Manila is declared an open city. MacArthur's going to leave. He's going to go to uh, the island fortress of Corregidor. He makes Kazon aware that they'll probably be doing this, uh, there on the docks on Christmas Eve, as they're going to uh, Corregidor, MacArthur and family will take to Don Esteban. Kazon goes on the presidential yacht and Admiral Hart shows up. MacArthur had failed to tell Hart they were declaring an open city and leaving. Hart knew what was going on. He had had wind of it a couple of days later. He'll, he'll, a couple of days later, he'll leave by submarine uh, to go south. And so now it's just MacArthur and the army forces and what Hart has left with him. They'll move into the headquarters at Malinta Tunnel. This is the headquarters lateral there. The tunnel is the worst thing. It was built 31, 38. It could hold about 7,000 people um, and pack about six months of rations, but it has not been packed because all that food stocks. Uh, when they were leaving Cabanatuan, uh, there were all the 
Public food stocks were there. Kazan would not let the army take the public food stocks, wouldn't let the people starve. Um, as Richard Frank said, no Nazi or Japanese general had ever had that. They've just taken it. They leave everything at Fort Stotzenberg. And so now everybody gets back in a willy nilly and you're all on half rations, basically. Now, the worst thing about they say about Melinda is when they ran out of the morphine and all you could hear was the screams nonstop. MacArthur won't live in the tunnel. World War I, he would never go into an air raid shelter or anything like that. Uh, you wonder about the Rouge Bouquet, how that effect had effect on him. He lives up topside for the first couple of days at George Moore, the uh, commandant's house, and it gets obliterated 27 December in the uh, first bombing raid there. Uh, MacArthur is standing there watching the bombers, and his aide has to push him into a ditch uh, because he, they were about to get uh, uh, totally blown up. Uh, Jean is, is up there as well. She hides in a in a bomb shelter. The place gets destroyed. Um, they'll move down into Malinta Tunnel, but MacArthur will take residence at a little house just east of the tunnel. This is the big shortcoming. They've got the AA weapons, but they don't have the right ammunition. They can't get the high shots and they can't reach the altitude. They're totally impotent to the air attacks that come from the Japanese. Now MacArthur's there at Malinta. This is the message that comes in December 27th. And Roosevelt's telling him the Navy's working on getting out to you. We're going to get total air power out there. We'll get control of the air. MacArthur's going to believe it all. Um, he's also putting out the communiques. And you all know the story with that. There's usually only one person mentioned, but he becomes the big hero in the allied world. They're the only ones besides Singapore really holding out in the Pacific. Hong Kong's fallen. Yep. And he'll become the hero of heroes to everybody back in America. Then the messages start coming in those first uh, week and a half, first three, four weeks. They're pumping them with everything about uh, help is on the way. We've got a stream of bombers coming there. We're going to gain air superiority. We've got uh, every ship is filled with pursuit aircraft, uh, troops and, and everything is on the way. January 10th, MacArthur makes his only visit to Corregid or to Bataan. Uh, PT boat takes him over there to Cobb Cobbin. And MacArthur goes and visits the Corps commanders, a couple of division heads, and basically tells them uh, what Washington's been telling him. Help is on the way. A couple of days later, he puts out this January 15th message. This is what will cause so much hatred from the troops because MacArthur will say there's no where to turn. There's no more retreating. Help is on the way. We've got to hold out till they come. I can't tell you when they'll come. And everyone will say MacArthur lied to him. The thing is, is if he had signed Roosevelt or Marshall's name to this, it wouldn't have been a lie because everything in there was exactly what was in these other messages. Mm. And just to interrupt you again, James, give you a break again. The, yes, we said at the beginning, you know, people love or they hate MacArthur. And mm. I, I'm reminded a little bit because we did a couple of shows a couple of weeks ago about the fall of Singapore. And of course, Percival there, you know, still being promised things in the Singapore plan. But when people are beating Percival with the stick about how badly he set the defenses, they kind of neglect to mention the fact that he's been given promises. And I think I'm, I'm feeling an echo of this here. And when people are trying to bash MacArthur and you've said yourself, he has made a few errors along the way, certainly sure. up to this point, but they, they don't sort of indicate that he is being given these promises, these false, these false promises. It, it, they kind of omit that bit because it, it, there are so many times when MacArthur's own, there's there's two ways of writing things. Like when you said how his refusal to go inside the tunnel, you can make that into a positive. You can you know you can spin it as Mac the general refuses to take cover because he's such a hero, or he's he's stubbornly not going into a safe place because he's he or should claustrophobic. Do. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems there's so many ways, so many opportunities where you can tell these stories one of two ways depending on what your opinion is. Yeah, and they'll stop after after January 9th. There's no more of those those type of messages roosevelt realized they they they, yeah. they can't stick them anymore now d did macarthur believe it um that you know that the help was on the way buckley says no uh right. buckley says he said it to keep him fighting buckley meets with him every day macarthur's uh so in love with this motor torpedo boat uh life that he meets with him pretty much every day um there on corregidor and um and buckley will say no he he didn't believe it when he put out that that message. Um, basically, after that visit, uh, that first line, the Abake line will fall. The Japanese had gotten over Mount Natib because nobody had put in any troops on it. They didn't think the Japanese could get through. They'll have to fall back to the Orion Bagak line. 
um, right after that. And that's where this, that's the second line. And that's where it'll stay until about uh, the first week of April when the Japanese make that move. Um, the biggest battles are there at the po at points in the pockets. The Japanese will try an amphibious run down on the west coast of Bataan. Um, and they'll get hit by all the provisional air troops, all those air people that didn't have any planes. They became an infantry unit, all the naval battalion, all the Navy guys that don't have any job. They become a battalion and they'll hold off the Japanese until finally they throw in the Philippine scouts and the that the, the part of the fourth Marines um, 45th and 57th scouts will pretty much wipe out those Japanese uh, pockets and, and um, the, the points areas, the motor torpedo boat squadron hadn't really done anything effective until about January. And that's when Admiral Walkwell, he's left there 16th Naval dish lets him go um, uh, on Christmas Eve, PT 30 boat 33 got lost. Uh, they got beached uh, or hit a reef. They had to burn it, blow it up. Um, but finally, on January 18th, they got orders to go up around Subic Bay and the 31 boat and the 34 boat go up there. This is Edward DeLong on the left, he's a Naval Academy graduate. Uh, he goes up there on the 31 boat. They split up that night before they're about to go after an attack on this two-masted, what they say is a cruiser. Um, the 34 boat does a PT run and they hit them with a couple of torpedoes. You got people on baton saying they saw it sink. The Japanese will never say that anything got sunk. The thing is, is the, when they get back, DeLong's boat is gone. They're not, they don't come back. And what had happened is the gas supply, the high octane aviation gas had all been sabotaged with wax, paraffin. Um, been thrown into all the barrels. It clogs all the the carburetors. It clogs all the strainers. And you constantly have to clean these things like every hour. When the 31 boat was up there, the it, the engines clogged and it floated onto a reef. They tried to rock it off. They couldn't get it off. And DeLong uh, blows up the boat. Uh, they all make it to Bataan and they have to skirt the shore until they finally make it back a couple of days later and, and 31. But so now you're down two boats that same night, uh, Cox on the uh, George Cox, he was a U.S. Naval Reserve guy. He uh, took the 41 boat down South Bataan and, uh, you know, was uh hitting Japanese right along the shore. Buckley will go on all these raids. The 24th, he goes with the 34 boat. This guy, Baron Chandler, the captain of that one, he gets shot through both of his ankles. I never found a picture of him, uh, but Buckley will do a boarding raid on a Japanese barge, take prisoners, blow the thing up. I mean, he's just a wild man. These guys are on all these exploits that none of their uh, kills will ever be confirmed by the Japanese, but um, their bravery is, is just is un unmatched. About mid-February, they fight them to a standstill. The Japanese uh, sit back and replenish, but they know that they're going to start bringing in new troops because now uh, Singapore's <coughs> basically fallen. On February 8th, uh, Kazan had just listened to the radio about all the supplies going to Russia and not to the Philippines. He wrote out this message to Roosevelt saying, uh, we should be declared neutral and you guys should pull out of here. Um, and this thing uh, needs to end with our neutrality. And MacArthur says on it, um, we're going to be starving soon. This thing isn't going to end. He's facing the reality of it. And he says, you know, we might give it a shot. And uh, back in Washington, they take that as, as he's falling apart. And MacArthur comes back and says, no, I didn't mean that. I'm planning on fighting to destruction. I will, you know, uh, the, I'm not going to surrender any part of the command. I'm not going to surrender the Filipinos. Uh, Kazan is not going to surrender. Um, you know, it was just kind of this last desperate thing that they put out. But Washington knows that they got to get Kazan out of there now. And they order MacArthur to get rid of Kazan, send him south. And then as well, all the diplomatic staff under Sayre, they'll go out on the USS Swordfish, Kazan on the 20th, Sayre on the 23rd. And now MacArthur is basically alone in the Philippines. But right before Kazon leaves, here's that second big controversy of the campaign. Kazon gives MacArthur $500,000. Now, MacArthur had uh, in his contract as the Philippine military advisor that he was due a percentage of every peso that was put into the the. Um, defense project. It comes out to about 500,000 uh, bucks. Roosevelt, Stimson, I Ickes, the Secretary of Interior, they all knew about the contract and that's why they allowed it to go through. The thing is, none of those other guys, Sutherland, Marshall, Huff, they had not been on um, part of that uh, uh, military mission and they get paid off. When Kazon goes back to the to the United States, he tries to give Eisenhower money, but Eisenhower's like, no way, you know, I'm not going to take this. And MacArthur does and has it transferred to a bank in the United States. 
Wow. And that's still uh, one of the biggest contentious things about MacArthur's yeah. entire career. Um, yeah. February uh, 11th, that day after they he sent back, they says, you know, I'm going to fight to destruction. And MacArthur knows what's going on. He starts having the armorer work out his 45 pistol. Uh, he thinks he's looking at the Alamo. He's lost 25 pounds. But is he really looking at that? Um, because we're not real sure. He, uh, we think he had other plans going once Kazon leaves. Uh, the big thing is that now the Australians, because the the Battle of the Java Sea, Sundra Straits, uh, has happened and uh, they are is about to happen. That at Australian Dutch British commands falling apart, they start lobbying for a, a American commander. Um, Australian John Curtin on the left will be writing Churchill, you know, to see if he can get him to get MacArthur from the Americans. This is what really gets Roosevelt on board with getting MacArthur out of there. And that's when he's going to send the message on the 23rd that we want you to to leave and go south and set up a new command in Australia. And this is the message that comes in. Clark Lee was an Associated Press uh, reporter. It was still there in the in Malinta. And he was there that day when MacArthur got the message. He said, MacArthur was never looked worried, never looked angry, never looked agonized, never looked stressed. He always looked like somebody that was holding four aces, um, always. But when he saw him after he got this message, he said that, uh, he saw him break. He saw, you know, the that he goes totally ash and white. And wow. MacArthur basically said, where's Gene? You know, he needs to talk to Gene MacArthur. <clears throat> the thing is, what are they going to do? Do they send a submarine up there? That's what the, the United States says. They'll send a submarine to come get him. MacArthur's like, no, I'm going to wait. I got to figure out if I just leave right now, everybody's going to freak out here, which they do anyway when he does leave. <clears throat> and so he's talking to Sutherland about what they should do. They have the stories. They got the staff together and went over all the message traffic said, look, this is all the stuff that's supposedly in Australia. Let's get down there and we can come back and be able to, uh, you know, liberate this thing out. Now, the thing is, is this is the weight. And this is, I think, what affects MacArthur, the whole campaign. And his a chief engineer will say so as well. MacArthur's not thinking about anything but these two. He should have gotten them out in July of 41. He should have sent them out earlier, probably by submarine. But now he's got them on Corregidor. And, you know, if they stay, he knows all of them are going to die, maybe by his own hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, so then MacArthur starts thinking. And the thing is, is on the 18th, of February. This is five days before he gets that message. He has that uh, army officer, Sid Huff, go to see Buckley and says, what do you think about making a run down to Mindanao? Can your boats handle it? So MacArthur's thinking something, you know, am I, can I send my family out by PT boat, you know, and I'll stay here. Is he thinking maybe I'll go to Mindanao, set up a guerrilla command? Cause there's a lot talking about that. But the thing is, is even though they say they're having this meeting that night, Sutherland comes up with the list that day of who's going to be leaving. The War Department says you can take your family and your chief of staff. Uh, we want you to bring the two Navy commanders, Ray and Rockwell, and the air commander, uh, Harold George. Um, but MacArthur's, I'm taking them all. And he takes, uh, you know, this top staff so that when he gets to Australia, he'll have somebody to be able to to work with um, as he gets down there. On the 28th, he says, Buckley, why don't you come over? And Buckley brings a PT-41 over to Corregidor, North Dock. MacArthur goes for uh, his ride on the PT boat just to see how he is. See, the PT boat uh, crews, you couldn't be over 30 years old. These things are getting slammed all over the place. You had to have sea legs. You had to be able to work it. MacArthur has to see, you know, if he, if he can handle it at 61. And they go on the calm Manila Bay, nothing like what it's going to be. Two days later, uh, MacArthur takes Gene out out uh, with Buckley on March 1st. He brings him over and Gene goes out. And I wonder, is this MacArthur's, you see, MacArthur has now totally entrusted his entire family to John Buckley. You mm. know, he, everything is resting on Buckley. And I think him taking Gene out is like, what do you think of him? Are you okay with this? You know, will you go by this? And nobody can believe he wants to go by PT boats because it's just, you know, ridiculous. Um, but Huff wonders, is is he claustrophobic? Is he worried about getting into a submarine? Mm. And so they make that ride on the first uh, MacArthur 
uh, they'll come back. MacArthur decorates Buckley with the Army Distinguished Service Cross for his services. And then he hits him with it. You know, I want to make this run by PT boat. What do you think? Can I make it? Buckley's like, no problem. Going to be a piece of cake. And he said later at the end of his life, uh, you know, that was me being a kid. I should have told him, no way. There's no way we should do this. Do you, do you think, up. James, he's putting his faith in Buckley, the man, or the PT boat, boat technology? Is it? No, because the man. The, the man. man. We, we don't really think. The negative people about MacArthur don't really think of him in, in, as being particularly loyal. He's not a people person in that way. He's very, very single-minded and and he, you know he doesn't necessarily rely on a staff like some commanders do but yeah, yeah my, my take of this is that it's not that it's if buckley had been using a, a, a whether he was a bomber pilot or an MT, mtb or submarine he's putting his faith in the guy you said yes. earlier how but he, he that buckley had an idea that an uh, insight into macarthur's feelings they've obviously bonded haven't they yes. so it's, it's all and about he knows because, he's a fighter and yeah. that's what MacArthur likes. And the other thing is, is Buckley looks like this now. I mean, he's he's his hair's grown. He's got this Fu Manchu mustache. He's got this beard. He doesn't have a hat anymore. He's just got an oil slicker. He wears 245s. He's got a big Bowie knife stuck in his belt. They say he's never far from a, a Thompson submachine gun. And Gene MacArthur is like, I trust him. He looks like a pirate. He's everything that MacArthur uh, worships. Wow. And so uh, when you say that, yes, I think he says, this is the guy I'm going with. You know, I'm I'm going to get out with him. And, and another question, if, you know, you, sure. you talked about the fact, the weight of the fact he has brought his family to Corregidor with him. Yeah. I, I don't like doing kind of counterfactual things, but just while we're at this point, let's say he he had got them out two months ago. They had, they had gone because... It seems to me he's on a bit of the horns of a bit of a dilemma because we said, you know, 61 years old. There's the the attraction. I'm using that word weirdly of kind of going down in that kind of Davy Crockett at the Alamo kind of way and get yourself in the history. And yet the other the other possibility, as you said, there is is being pulled out to Australia to start some new force. They're both they're both attractive options for someone who likes to to be in the in the news, so to speak, if, if his family weren't there, do you think that would have um, influenced his decision? I think if his family wasn't there, I don't think he would have left. Right. So the, the Alamo option would have been maybe the one he'd have gone with. Because as soon as they get on the boats, um, you know, and he's seasick, he's racked, you know, but that's the main thing. I left them all. Yeah. You know, and and that'll that'll be with him. Until they come back to Corregidor three years later. Right. You know, I, I left them all there. Okay. Uh, Huff and uh, James Ray, the captain, 16 Naval District, Buckley, they'll they'll work out the plan. Uh, it's a 580-mile a trip. They've got no equipment, no navigational equipment. They have no charts of anything. And so they're just going to go west and make a straight run down to Cagayan. It's about 35 hours of sailing. They get uh, the USS permit to meet them about halfway. That's at that Tagayan Island, which is in the Cuyo Islands. And that will be the plan. They'll make a run in a diamond formation. If they run into anything, everybody attacks uh, whatever they run into. And the 41 boat makes the run on their own. Uh, now, Here's the, the funniest things I found was this guy on the left is Pick Diller. He gets chosen to go out. The guy on the right is San, Stephen Melnick. He's uh, left on career. He's one of the guys that escapes from Deval Penal Colony in uh, April of 1943. But Diller in his oral history says that right before they left on the PT boats, all of a sudden people start coming to him, giving him letters to home, giving him, you know, and Diller's like, oh, there must have been loose lips. Everybody knows I'm going to be leaving. And then you read Melnick's oral history. And he says that they knew something was up. And he went to see Colonel Huff and Huff was like, shut up and get out of my face. You know, I'm not telling you anything. He goes and pressures this guy, Diller. Diller spills the beans about everything. And so when Diller's saying, oh, somebody must have talked, it was him that was talking. Now, the last day, MacArthur gets Wayne right in, tells him what the deal is. He's going to be leaving. You're going to be left here in charge on Corregidor. I'm putting King in charge on Bataan. I'm going to have uh, 
sharp in charge down on Mindanao. Y'all are going to be divided. There's not going to be one commander. I'll still be in command. Um, that way, if one force surrenders, the other doesn't have to surrender. The thing is, is MacArthur never tells Washington that. And as soon as MacArthur's gone, they're dealing with Wainwright as the number one guy. And the Japanese know that. That's why when uh, Corregidor surrenders, they know he's in charge. And when he's trying to say, no, I don't have control of those other people. On the last day, March 11th, MacArthur calls Buckley and he had been telling him they'd leave on the 15th and he calls him in and says, no, we're going to leave tonight. Uh, Huff said it was because of the moon, um, but other people say it's because all over the radio, they were talking about how Australia wanted MacArthur to be the new commander and the Japanese uh, naval activity had picked up around the islands. Uh, this guy in the middle is Louis Beebe. He's the guy that will be the chief of staff delineating out MacArthur's orders on Corregidor to everybody there. But like I said, it's not something that's going to work. March 11th the day. They plan on going at 8 o'clock that night. They split them all up as to where they'll be picked up. A lot of the officers on Corregidor go over to Bataan. As you can see right over here, this is Sisamon Cove, Maravellas Harbor. That's where the 32, 34, and the 35 boats will pick up their parties. Buckley will come to the North Dock at Corregidor up here. He'll arrive about 7.30. MacArthur will come out with his family and uh, the James Ray, Sutherland, and Huff. And they'll all get on. MacArthur does take takes nothing with him. Um, Gene takes a small suitcase that has a dress, a few things for Arthur. Um, they'll bring their Chinese Ama who takes care of the kid. Everybody will really criticize that. Why didn't you take some nurse with you? And uh, basically, if, if he had, that would have been bad news because in Asia, you know, the the Ama is part of the family. You left part of your family here to be tortured by the Japanese. Hmm. They leave at about 7:45. They're going to meet up. Um, right outside the buoy for the uh, minefield, which will be shut off. And then they'll start making the run at about eight o'clock. All these boats are in bad shape. Um, the 32 boat had had an explosion in the uh, engine room in early January. It's put to together with bailing wire, clamps, everything else. It can only make about 22 knots. They're going to have all the problems with the gas, everything else. And they'll be heading out into nowhere. 34 boat is under Kelly. He's a USNA graduate of Annapolis. He had in infected his finger in early December. He caught it on a piece of metal on his boat and he didn't go to the doctor. And so when they finally sent him to the doctor on Corregidor, they said, we're going to have to cut your arm off. And he was like, what? And uh, they finally got him all stitched up. He becomes the commander of the 34 boat. And uh, when they take off, uh, his one can't keep up because they're having all this engine trouble. And Buckley slows down to wait for him. But then Kelly rigs the carburetors so they're wide open and they go flying past Buckley and everybody. Nobody sees them again till the next afternoon because they go, you know, flying past everybody. Now he's got Admiral Rockwell. That's the guy on the uh, up here. And Rockwell thinks that Kelly is out of his mind. This kid does not know what he's doing. And so he goes up to uh, Kelly and says, hey, give me a reading on that point over there. And Kelly holds up his thumb and his forefinger and says, oh, it's about 400 yards. And that's when Rockwell realizes they have no navigational equipment. They have no charts. They have basically nothing. And uh, they'll be the first ones down to that Tagalian Island. Um, Rockwell won't think that Kelly knows where he is, but uh, he knows exactly where he is. And they sit there and wait uh, for everybody else. The 35 boat is under uh, Anthony Akers. This is one of the group that leaves from uh, Sissi, Sissi Cove. They're having so much engine trouble. Nobody will see them for the rest of the trip until about eight o'clock on the night of, of, uh, of the second night when they roll into Tagalian Islands. Schumacher's boat, the 32, this is the one held together with the bailing wire. The next morning, uh, they're around the Cuyo Islands, and uh, Schumacher, I don't have a picture of him, he sees a uh, destroyer coming at him. He dumps all. They say they had to take about 20 uh, 55 gallon drums of, of extra fuel on it, and he dumps all the gas going on a torpedo run against what he sees as a destroyer. General Casey, he's the engineer. He says, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. And they realize it's PT-41. Buckley shows up on the 41 boat and he is just eviscerates Schumacher, dumping all his gas, almost blowing MacArthur to smithereens. 
They'll round up as much gas as you can. They'll go to the first island they can uh, find because it's daylight already. They'll hide out there till about two o'clock. The 35 boat doesn't show up, but then they'll make the run down to uh, Tagayan, and that's where they'll meet up with uh, the 34 boat that's waiting there. MacArthur had been incapacitated the whole ride. All of them were sick. The only one that wasn't sick was Jean, and that she was the one that thought she would be the sickest. And MacArthur's basically... Uh, catatonic and can't move everybody on the boat thought he was going to die you know but oh. uh, he was uh because he was so out of it you know retching the whole time but in his mind you know it's man i left everybody now the 41 boat and 32 boat uh they get down to that tagalian island they'll meet up with uh the 34 boat admiral rockwell uh buckley and captain ray will figure out if they're going to leave or not Buckley's like, let's go, let's go. We got to leave now. You know, they're not going to wait for that submarine because uh, the submarine's still late. Um, and then uh, uh, Rockwell's like, yeah, okay, let's go. The the weather isn't going to be that bad. And Buckley's like, nope, it's going to be ten times worse than it was. Uh, they leave the thirty two boat there under Schumacher. Schumacher's supposed to wait for the for the the boat and then. Um, uh, the and then leave for uh, to Panay to get extra fuel and and make it down to Mindanao finally. Uh, and that's the last time they'll see Schumacher. They don't know what's happened to him for about a month. They'll leave at about six o'clock that night, head into the open sea towards Mindanao. And uh, MacArthur will wake up about midnight, um, after being stretched out, and he'll wake up Huff. And for three hours, Huff says it's the weirdest session he's ever had. MacArthur just sits there talking, going over everything from the past four years until finally it gets to the point where he's like, I'm going back. And and Huff said he was actually scared because MacArthur had this look like he was about to kill everybody at that point. Wow. The, the goofy thing is here is they just are driving blind through the ocean uh, and they make it all the way uh, to Cagayan. Um, where they drop off about seven in the morning. Uh, they pull in, there's a, a colonel named William Morse there. He meets the party and he said, MacArthur is coming in, standing up on the, the bow of the 41, kind of like Washington crossing the Delaware. And they get off, MacArthur tells Buckley, you've taken me out of the jaws of death. You know, I can never repay you. And he awards everybody there the silver star. Um, they go there because that's where the Del Monte plantation is, uh, the Del Monte pineapples. They've got a bunch of airstrips. It's been laid out that B-17s will come in and pick them up there. Um, everybody immediately goes into relaxation mode. They're not on Corregidor anymore. Um, and finally, the 35 boat will show up. It had met Schumacher at about 8 o'clock that night. He was still waiting for the, the submarine. And he'll come back, and, and they'll make it to Cagayan. Uh, Buckley's very happy. Now the whole staff is there. But Buckley still doesn't know what happened to 32. He's going up in the back seat of airplanes uh, over the Cuyo Islands trying to uh, find what's happened to that boat. And he's not going to find out till about a month later in Australia. MacArthur meets with Sharp, the Sign Mindanao Command, tells him uh, what the deal is. You're in separate command. Um, I'll be in control still. If this thing falls apart, I want you to go gorilla. Everybody goes to the hills, hold them off, and we're going to get back here as fast as we can uh, with all the stuff we're going to pick up in Australia. They fly the first couple of B-17s in. They get there on 14 March. One of them crashes in Cagayan Bay. Only one of them lands. It's a very old B-17. It's one of the original um, 19th bomb group group from Philippines. Um, it's haggard. It's got a 24-year-old pilot that uh, MacArthur says, I'm not getting in a plane with everybody with that kid at the at the helm. He contacts Washington and says, I want you know two flyable planes up here. And the Navy guy, Leary, uh, says, I'm not sending any brand new B-17s for a, a ferry mission. I don't care who it is. And, uh, and Washington says, yeah, you'll send them up there. And it's funny because when uh, MacArthur gets down to Australia, Leary's gone very quickly. They fly the, uh, finally two other B-17s will come in. Everybody will climb on. They throw a mattress on there. They have to leave their luggage back. The mattress for Arthur MacArthur to lay down. Um, MacArthur will sit up there in the radio man's uh, seat for most of the trip flying back. They land at Bachelor Field, which is about 40 miles from Darwin because Darwin is getting uh, attacked by the Japanese at that time. And they know that they'll be at Bachelor soon. Gene MacArthur's like, I'm not getting in another plane. But the thing is, is they had brought along this doctor. Nobody had ever seen him before. He had been an Air Corps doctor on Bataan, but they put him on the boat to take care of, of Arthur MacArthur. 
And so then they use the doctor to get everybody back on the plane. They say, oh, Arthur's not doing too good. We need to get him on that plane and down to Alice Springs because there's no train that goes to Alice Springs from Darwin. You'd have to take a car. And so they get him on a DC-3. They fly him down there and they'll pick up the narrow gauge train that takes him down to Adelaide, then Sydney, and then uh, Melbourne finally. And that's where MacArthur will give that statement, uh, I shall return. On the way to Melbourne, he'll, his chief of, deputy chief of staff marshal shows up. And whereas they thought all that stuff had been sent to Australia, nothing was there. Uh, no planes, no men, no Australian troops, no nothing. And it's a pretty much a slap in the face uh, again for uh, MacArthur. And he'll feel totally betrayed uh, by that. Yeah. Buckley and the PT boats, uh, the day after they get there, the 34 boat got grounded. It got a big hole in it. MacArthur gave him a mission because Kazon is Tarkin neutrality again. And he tells Buckley, go up there and get him off uh, the island of Negros. Buckley goes up there with the uh, 41 and the 35 boat. Uh, they're in the channel there right out Dumaguete and the 35 boat hits something. It gets a hole in it. It gets beached there. And um, Buckley basically has to order Kazon on the PT boat uh, to take him to Mindanao at gunpoint because Kazon's like, I'm not going. He's totally scared of this pirate he sees. And Buckley's sitting there, you know, with the guns, the Bowie knife, and finally just uh, coerces him to get on the damn boat, which he does. And they get him down to Mindanao. He'll fly to Australia. And that's the thing. Um, on April 8th, uh, they'll have the 34 boat back. They had hauled it up to Cebu. It got fixed. Um, they'll go out to meet... Um, reports of destroyers uh, that night on April 8th, right around Negros. It's actually a couple of destroyers in a cruiser and um, they'll get hounded. The 34 boat will get beached again. And the 41 boat is now the only boat that's left. They bring it back to Mindanao and, and then that the PD boat service is over. Uh, they're going to take that up to Lake Lanao and it gets lost in the jungle when they're trying to get it up there. Buckley will fly down to Australia. He'll be uh, removed by um, MacArthur on one of those last planes as well. Uh, uh, Robert Kelly will get removed. George Cox will get removed. Um, Brandingham, he was the guy that crashed the 33 boat right at the beginning. He'll get removed. Baron Chandler, that guy that got shot on the 34 boat, he'll get captured in Corregidor Hospital. He'll get liberated at Bilibid. Um, that Edward DeLong, who lost the 31 boat, He'll uh, get one of the last PBYs down to Mindanao, but he can't get out. He'll try to get on a, a boat and sail to Australia, and he gets captured in the Celebes and, cap and decapitated by the Japanese. When Buckley gets to Australia, he goes to this dinner. He has a new uniform. He's clean shaven, he, and Kazon's there, and Kazon's giving a speech. He finds out that that's Buckley, and he's giving the speech saying, when your dad came to liberate me, I was as scared as the devil. And everybody starts laughing. And it's only then that Kazon realizes that this is the guy that came to pick him up. You know, he's totally clean shaven. And he said, if I had seen you without your beard, I wouldn't have gotten on the on the ship. With you. Wow. <laughs> All these guys will go back to America. Kelly Cox, um, Buckley, they'll be highly feted um, and they'll be basically heroes of. Buckley will be a big war bond drive guy speaking about the PT boats, even though they can't confirm that anything they did, their bravery was just unquestionable. Um, all of them will come back to the Pacific. Kelly will get his own squadron uh, and Cox will get his own squadron. And uh, uh, Buckley as well will go on to greater fame in the South Pacific and then at D-Day uh, running PT boats there. Um, and finally, He'll meet with the president. MacArthur put him up for the Medal of Honor, but Admiral Ernest King said, no way is an army guy taking precedent over me. So he puts him up for it and he gets rewarded by Roosevelt. And when he goes to the White House, he tells him um, MacArthur needs about 300 more PT boats because that's what MacArthur told him. MacArthur also told him to tell him that you let us all down. We were all waiting for you. You told mm -hmm. us all this stuff was going to happen. And Buckley goes ahead and tells him. And he'll become persona non grata to the rest of the Navy. Um, they can't believe he's sticking up for MacArthur. Admiral King will detest him because of it. And they'll basically start calling him MacArthur's errand boy. Um, wow. Quite a way to deal with this guy who pulled off so much with so little. MacArthur, of course, will get a new command uh, within a month of getting to Australia. Bataan surrenders and 75,000 go on the death march. A month later, Corregidor Falls, another 20,000 in captivity. 
50% will die in captivity. MacArthur will never forget having to leave them. And these guys will never forgive, nor will they forget that MacArthur left them. A lot of them, you know, come to the conclusion that's what had to happen, but a lot of them will never uh, forget. And he will be dug out, dug to them for forever. And it's not, like I said, until March 2nd that that's the end of it. And that's pretty much the story. Well, I mean, incredible. Um, we, we'll do some questions if anyone has any. I mean, my, my comments are is I know what the answer you, this first one will be is that under, you know, you, you talked about how, how famous Buckley was in the war and there's the war bonds driving to that. But in the nearly 80 years since then, this story has ended up becoming all about MacArthur. I think that these these rescuers have been a little bit lost from the narrative over the years. I mean, they, they were in the story back then, but they've been lost a bit. And it does come down to the whether or not you think it's dug out, dug uh, or, or hero that, that, that has been the focus of people's yeah. um, interest. And it's glad, I'm, I guess you're pleased to be able to tell the story of these, these rescuers as well, because it's, well, they're, the, they're the guys, you know, they're, yeah. they're the ones that do it. And uh, if it hadn't been for them, you know, M MacArthur wouldn't have gotten out of there and the whole, the whole war would have been uh, quite different, quite different. Um, and you know, have you over the years? We'll do some questions from the from the viewers. But have 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 your opinions about MacArthur leaving the Philippines changed? Have you always had one feeling, and it's never changed? Do you do do you waver between different options as you read more things? What what's your take on it personally, as as, as someone who's been in the job you said nearly thirty years now? What what's yeah. your take? Well, you know, I, I have a fluid thing. Uh, sometimes I'm. Uh, you know, I think, like you just said, I'm I'm more amazed at what the the PT boat guys did. Um, you know, would would MacArthur have had to resign his commission if he stayed there? Um, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is is you know, as much as you want to say about the Southwest Pacific campaigns, you know, that's all MacArthur. I mean, he's he's. He's got Kruger and Kinney and um, Barbie to, you know, put everything together. Um, but he's that main drive. And that's, you know, that's what Kruger will even say is you've got to have someone who can stare into the dark. And when everybody else is freaking out, be there and say, no, don't worry, this thing's going to work out, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what, you know, he, it comes down to. I mean, you got a 52 year career. You're going to have a lot of mistakes. Um, and the, you know, even when you get into Korea, you know, should he have been there at 70 years old? You know, here he's 60 years old. There's nobody else that, that old there, you know, commanding any kind of theater. And it's just the, you know, that power of personality he has. Um, who else would you have gotten to run Southwest Pacific? I don't, I don't well, think, that, that. Yeah. I don't that, know. That, I don't know if there would have been a Southwest Pacific theater without MacArthur. I think it would have all been Central Pacific Navy drive. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's when, when I, as a Normandy guy, when when Americans particularly start throwing about uh, the idea about how awful Field Marshal Montgomery is, I go, okay, well before before you list all the things you don't like about Montgomery, give me the alternative person to have the yeah. role he did, commanding Twenty First Century, because. If you don't want him there, you've got to put up a viable candidate to to be there instead, and that that's when they tend to go. Uh, uh, and if they say Patton, I go no because there's no way Patton could handle all that logistics side of things <laughs> and the boring things like harbors. He's just that's not what he interests him. So that I think the same thing applies to MacArthur. Faults he certainly has lots of faults, and I've had a lot of historians yeah. on there on here who don't have a lot to say positive about him. But again like yourself they're saying who who would there be instead who 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 is the obvious person to do the job instead and i can't really think of one you know um uh, montgomery comes to visit macarthur in new york in 1955 and he puts out a statement afterward that macarthur was the greatest commander of world war ii and i think he only said that because he wasn't in montgomery's theater <laughs> yeah 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 so they're, so they're, they're, when those very theory, similar and, people when those two are in a room together, my God, that was a clash of egos. We talk about <laughs> Montgomery with Eisenhower, Montgomery with Eisenhower, but Montgomery and 
MacArthur. That's like yeah. a disturbance in the force that day, isn't it? I mean, that's 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 two planets kind of uh, colliding there. Wow. We well, had a question they, there about yeah, okay. um, specifically about what is your opinion on Manchester's biography of MacArthur? Uh, Manchester plagiarized D. Clayton James. Uh, James had written his two first two volumes when Manchester does his book. You can put Manchester's book next to James's book, and he paraphrases every single paragraph for like a hundred pages. <laughs> and they should have sued him, you know. But the thing is, is James is out of print. Manchester is still the one that's in print. He's the one that everybody knows. I talked to Arthur MacArthur, uh, Douglas MacArthur's son, yeah. and he said that was his favorite. Because he said he felt Manchester captured the feel of the times as well as his father better than anyone else did. Mm. Mm. And and just to, to bring the, the the I shall return. The, the you know you mentioned it there. Um, we had a question. Someone said it earlier. I think how how planned was that? Because you know he's sick for the boat journey. Then you explain there's lots of stress about which aircraft. Is he methodically thinking out what he's going to say when he gets to uh, finally gets the press in front of him, or is it a spur of the moment thing? Oh, I think it's I think it's well thought out, you know, because there is no national strategy to do anything about the Philippines, and basically he says right there he puts it on the table. You know, this is mm. something, and the thing is, he has so much support back in the United States that all these people are like, yeah. You, you got to support him. You got to get us back to the Philippines and, you know, uh, undo this, you know, great injustice that was that was done to them. So, no, I don't think it was just something he said. Um, people uh, Carlos Romulo said he said, I shall return to him before he left uh, the Philippines. Uh, and uh, people said they thought he they heard him say it on the dock there. But the first big statement is there. Uh, at Adelaide. And it was, it was, it was written out, you know, he pulled out a piece of paper that he had as a statement. So, you know, and, and he says right in it, you know, as I will go back to liberate the Philippines, as the president said, is the reason why I've come here, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the next question is about, about modern biographies, because one of the things that's come up on this channel before is I'm thinking about talking about uh, with John Buckley, who is a historian at Wolverhampton University, how his younger students doing war studies don't come with the same baggage of people of my generation where we have an opinion because of my youth about Patton and MacArthur and Monty, and that the younger people are just looking at these figures a little bit more neutrally, and they're, they're basing it on, okay, so what were the decisions at the time there? So with the modern book, because obviously in in the monument there, you get all all the new Monu uh, MacArthur books. Obviously, find their way to you. So, are you seeing that in recent years, younger historians are being a little bit more objective, and they're not they're not coming in with a pro or against feeling to begin with? Well, that's the positive aspect of twenty twenty hindsight. Yeah, you know, thank you. Mr. General, who knows everything that's happened. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you could say that, but, you know, it, it goes back to, you know, even to today, what it, you know, the thing about war, what is it? You go into a room with a plan and then they turn the lights out yeah. and the plan goes right out the window, you know, so it's, it's a, it's easy to sit there and, and judge what's done and how they should have done it. Um, and, but I think that, uh, a lot of them overthink it in that sense. They don't yeah. they don't look at the darkness that you're staring into, you know, like us today with Ukraine. Hmm. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, much less this afternoon. Yeah, no, that's, that's certainly the case. And, and with regards to MacArthur's legacy, because there's certain people from the, I mean, Eisenhower, I don't think he's ever going to fall off the pedestal he has risen to. And I'm a huge Eisenhower fan. Other people come and go up and down through phases. Montgomery is uh, going through a bit of an up now with people. I mean, we're, we're talking the ETO, James Gavin of the 82nd is going on a bit of a down uh, trend at the moment. And where, where do, there's, do you think MacArthur is, where is he right now? Is he on a wave of people liking him or hating him? And, and where do you think he'll be perhaps in 10, 20 years time, you know, with the, with a new generation of historians coming, coming through, where will we be, you know, say 10 years on from now? Well, it's, 
it's hard to say because I've seen the pendulum swing so many times just since I've, <laughs> I've been here. The thing is, with MacArthur, there's seven statues and monuments to him in seven different countries, hmm. you know, not just America. And that's not because he went and conquered people. You know, it's because he went and liberated, you know, protector of Australia, liberator of the Philippines, steward of Japan, defender of Korea. And so he's thought of very highly in a lot of other countries and maybe not so much because, like you said, time's going by and people look at things. But MacArthur's career, uh, it goes back to Red Blake was a, a football coach at, at Army and he was a great friend of MacArthur's and people, you know, it had heard what they heard about MacArthur. They didn't know him, you know, but they heard all the stories and they were like, why do you like that guy? And, uh, you know, with all the things that have gone wrong in his career and Blake said, well, you know, you look at it as a guy catches a kickoff and he runs all the way for the touchdown. And then he goes to the coach. He's like, Hey coach, what'd you think? And he's like, well, you jigged when you should have jagged, you held the ball wrong. You should have done this, you know, instead of that, and then the player's like, well, how was I for distance? You know, and that's the way you got to look at MacArthur. I mean, World War I, unbelievable. You know, nobody has a problem with him, you know, at that point. He comes back. He becomes an educator, revamps West Point. He's the savior of West Point because it was destroyed. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's this mass, you know, educator as well. And then, you know, he has an affection for peoples around the world that are not white. Yeah. You know? And so you can't label him as some sort of, you know, white colonialist or anything. That was the one of the main things they didn't like him about him in the Philippines because all he hung out with was Filipinos. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I can so think of other, other figures who don't have that same reputation. <laughs> as being um, welcoming of other cultures and colors. Yeah. And people only, you know, I find they, you know, there's, there's two sides to a lot of things. And the, you know, the, the second side isn't, isn't known a lot, you know, about MacArthur. I mean, is he an arrogant guy? Yeah, sure. You know, he can also be very humble with certain people, you know, in certain occasions. I often say he's schizophrenic. You know, because he's he's kind of like a guy's, no, I don't want that medal. I don't want the accolades. But if you don't give it to him, it's like, hey, buddy, where's my medal? You know? Yeah. He's almost like this fast, multifaceted gem you look through and you see him differently from every side that you look in. Well, that, I mean, that, that's really change. Yeah, it'll keep changing. You know, I th I because think that's, the, that's the, an interesting thing. People are now doing... Um, kind of psychoanalysis of these figures now, and you know, yeah. what was Hitler's sexuality? And there's this idea <laughs> yeah. that I think I have to kind of agree with that Montgomery, for example, who we bring up again, was either Asperger's or autistic and on you know, somewhere on the spectrum. And I think, really, really, yeah, that, that, yeah that, that's definitely come, come up there as a possibility wow. of where some of his personality comes from. Yeah. And I mean, the difficulty is with some of these people is that we don't know enough about their private lives, you're, you're, you're not, you can't really give a diagnosis. So these are these are kind of, these are people sort of giving their opinions based on 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 a lack of information. As we said right. at the beginning, if if someone comes to your memorial and look in your archives, if they come there as an avid hater of MacArthur, they can find enough material to fill a book. And if they come there sure. as an avid lover of MacArthur, they can find enough material to fill a book. It, it, it's it's all there. It depends what you're looking for and what it is you're trying to say. Well, that's what I always say. I, I have more ammunition to bury the guy. Than yeah. Go. But, you know, I also know where the the stuff is that says, hey, man, you better stop and, and think about this, you know, for for a minute. And uh, and th that's the way I think most serious historians are. You know, I, I mean, I, I, Richard Frank, who I, I revere as one of the, you know, the yeah, great, great historians of, of the 20th and 21st century. Um, you know, he he always says that he has to, you know watch what he thinks about MacArthur. Cause all of a sudden something will happen. It'll be just like, man, I didn't know that, you know? And, uh, and it, 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 it just shows you, you, you gotta be on, on top of the game. Yeah. And it comes down to intentions, isn't it? I mean, if we're, if we're discussing some of the third Reich and Axis leaders, their intentions were power, control, mass murder, genocide, and so yeah. on. 
the allied leaders that we have the right to discuss because we live in a democracy. We have a right to have an, a YouTube discussion discussing Patton's merits, Montgomery's merits, MacArthur's merits. They all had the best interests of their countries and the allies at heart. And of course, they got things wrong. As you said, they're over a 32 year career. You're not going to have every day perfect it's that mm. me as a youtuber well we started 10 minutes later today because of things you know <laughs> no one died because we started 10 minutes later right. if you're a general and you start something 10 minutes late that means the invasion starts 10 minutes Everything. late and people die so it's the it's the level of with that responsibility with that command comes that responsibility and that the fact that when they get things wrong the, the consequences are big right the the thing I always don't understand is, you know, when you get into Korea where MacArthur just, you know, gets a lot, of, so much criticism. Um, here you are with Stalin, Mao, and Kim Il-sung, three of the great mass murderers of the 20th century. But yet MacArthur is your villain. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, you know, that's that to me is just always wrong, kind of kind of screwy. That, that is a really good way to kind of end this, really, is that when we're talking about villains in World War II, MacArthur's not in the top 10. He's not anywhere near the top, you know, the top <laughs> 50. If we're looking at the global leaders, there's a lot more who are way higher up. It's just he is what he is. He's a character. He's a character with flaws like all of us. And and we have highlighted the bad ones over the years. And we've also should be highlighting the good ones. But well, we just had a couple of questions about you said at the beginning. Your archive is still expanding there. What kind of new materials are still coming in, you know, 70 well, plus years on? Uh, like, you know, we have a lot of people that spend their whole lives collecting everything they can find on Corregidor, you know, the right. harbor ports. I have a guy, um, he's a good friend now, um, George Munson. He, he had done that and he's sent maybe 75 shelf feet of material you know, that wow. he's collected, that's photographs, memoirs, diaries. Um, Bill Barsh, who wrote all the uh, books about the air power in the Philippines, you know, I've got all his research now. So a lot of it is, is you know, research from people, um, a lot of uh, civilian internees from the Philippines, um, a lot of uh, just veterans who, you know, the, especially during COVID, people were going up in their attics and pulling everything down. And that's when the windfall happened because wow. they were all finding everything. And every day I was having more and more things, you know, shipped to us, you know, wax who served in Australia, uh, guys that were in um, Air Corps units, you know, send me their stuff. And they have a picture of every piece of nose art, you know, that came through their air drum. So it's, to me, it's Christmas every day. Um, wow. You know, and, and well, uh, that's why I've well, never left. Well, and, and we we are all uh, grateful that you're still there because people have said this is one of the best shows they've ever seen on World War Two TV already. So I think it's going right. to go. If there is a chart of of top ten World War Two TV shows, you are you are a, a good good sounding to be in that top ten, if not the top five. So we'll bring things in. Dren, I'm just reminding people what we've got coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye in a second. So, folks, tomorrow and Sunday we've got two kind of. Um, random shows coming your way tomorrow at 1 p.m. GMT. We are looking at Thailand. Uh, with a wonderful historian of actually economics, but he's also going to tell us about World War II in Thailand. That's at 1 p.m. GMT tomorrow on Saturday. And then Sunday evening or Sunday afternoon, depending on where you are, the friend of the show, Alex Kershaw, is coming on to talk about his latest book about the Medal of Honor recipients in the third division. So that's Audie Murphy and a few others. So we always enjoy having Alex. And then on Monday, Navy Naval Battles Week commences properly. We've got some great shows about the Royal Indian Navy. We've got a look at the uh, Arctic convoys to Murmansk. So great stuff coming your way. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to click subscribe. Subscribe. Don't forget to become uh, uh, follow us on social media. Maybe become a member. The link to James's book on MacArthur is in the description below. The link to the MacArthur Memorial is in the description below. So go out and check those resources. Many people have mentioned the sidebar that James does a fantastic podcast for Memorial. Go and check that out there. If you want more of James, there's more available on other platforms. So there we are. I'll bring just James back in again to say um, thank you very much. Well, thank you. It has been amazing. Uh, in terms of detail, facts per minute, you hold some kind of record there. Absolutely amazing <laughs> stuff. So um, I've enjoyed talking to you. Uh, back, you're back to the work for you. You're at work, aren't you? So it's Yeah. 
yeah back back to the, the day job so um thank you very much for joining us and i hope you'll come back again and if you want to pitch an idea for something else to talk about with regards to macarthur we'll take you back anytime anytime thanks paul brilliant cheers then thanks everybody i'll see you all again tomorrow cheers bye weekend.